Let him close the door here and get the recording apparatus started. All right, first off, welcome to Asheville. I uh, already introduced, uh, met some of you. My name is Andy Giles. Um, I work with uh, Dustin Harrell over here in the white shirt. We run Blue Oak Interactive here in town. Um, been in business about five years. And we do um, Drupal consulting and development, primarily around Drupal Commerce and third-party uh, API integrations. Um, this session is going to be a little bit unique in that I'm doing a White Elephant game show. I have some prizes to give away. How it works is I'm going to ask some trivia questions throughout the slides. Uh, if you get them right, you get a prize. The next person to get it right can take your prize or they can get what's in the box next. Okay. And if they take your prize, then you get what's next. And uh, some, some cool stuff. Some of the uh, vendors that I'm talking about in the slides were kind enough to give us some, some swag to give away. So that's where that comes from. Uh, let's see. So the, uh, the topic of this slide is one de uh, deployment workflow. And it's how to solve the problem of working on multiple projects, Drupal 6 through 8, across multiple hosting environments, multiple different dependencies, you know, um, how you streamline your workflow and um, simplify and minimize human error, that kind of stuff. Uh, so one deployment workflow, Drupal 6 through 8, all hosting providers say, what? And hopefully my and little video like, will play. what? And he was like, what? And I'm like, what? Does anybody know the character name, not the actor? Okay, the actor? <laughs> All right. First gift, you know, t shirt. Get lab. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So, the problem that we have, um, as I mentioned, um, we run a, a consultancy. We have anywhere <coughs> from five to a dozen projects that we're in and out of every week, whether it just be a of security <coughs> updates or you know, actively building out new functionality or whatever it may be. Um, and within that we had, you know, get, most everything's Git, thankfully, uh, nowadays for us, for our projects. But we had, you know, some were Composer, some were Dresh Make, some didn't have a build process, some we had to SSH into a server to deploy, some we had to FTP, um, Dresh DL, Dresh Up, um, and then you have, of course, the, the different hosting environments, the three common ones that we use are uh, Platform, Pantheon, and Acquia. Each one of those have their own established workflow, their file structure. So you can imagine, you know, working on these projects, you forget something or you, you know, implement something wrong or whatever it may be. So how do we solve that problem? How do we dumb down the workflow so that we can just do the work, commit it, and not have to worry about it? And so uh, the, the solution we came up with uh, was right along the time that Platform SH came out. Um, and they had a really nice build process baked into their workflow uh, that is based on Drush Make. So you convert your site into um, a Drush Make file, which for anybody that doesn't know, all of the modules that you have in your project, you define in one text file uh, and you hard code the version. Um, if there's any patches that are uh, needing to be applied to that, you you know, specify those and you know that every time your site builds, all the dependencies that are pulled from the internet, Drupal.org or GitLab, GitHub, are going to be the same and you don't have to worry about it. Another big benefit is um, if you do have patches, which if you do Drupal Commerce development, you're going to have patches, guaranteed. <laughs> uh, if you do that, then uh, you know that your patch applied and you didn't, you know, some developer forgot to look in the patches folder and they updated views and now functionality that broke six months ago is broken again. That kind of thing. So, so this solution solved all of our problems at once, and it was great. And um, yeah, but there's more problems right now. So we have um, a lot of our clients on on platform, but what about um, Pantheon or Acquia or, or GoMama or whatever the uh, hosting environment that this new client is using? How do we manage that? Um, another problem that this workflow introduced was that the utility that comes with Platform SH, Platform Build, it got bloated over time. We were early adopters of it, so they would um, like restructure how it would build the files into different directories, and so 
Yeah, we just had some problems. Like uh, one of the examples is within PHP Storm. If you're tracking a directory or if you're tracking a project, you have to exclude some directories that are um, you know not necessary um, because PHP Storm will try to index them, and then your your memory will go out of control. And yeah, so you have to exclude those. So um, the fact that they were moving things around and and whatever else, um, it just became problematic for us. Um, so the the next stuff step was to look into continuous integration methodologies and what other people are doing and you know with um, Pantheon for example before multi-dev was available you know you had one branch that was across all your environments and that's a pretty hard workflow in my opinion to work with so how do you how do you improve that how do you have uh, other branches that that push to that environment or uh, or you know more dynamic so we started looking at um, continuous integration, and um, my definition of continuous integration is, is updating code frequently with confidence, um, and then continuous delivery is pushing code into an environment, again, with confidence. And if anybody can name the character, boom, my man, get some socks. Oh. <laughs> steal the t-shirt, or you steal the t-shirt. Oh, that, that's right, I, I should have... Uh, Made the ultimatum first. All right, we're, we're learning here. It's okay. Um, so, anyways, uh, yeah, with confidence is the the main thing, right? Um, when you're developing, working on Drupal projects, you're working across multiple clients. You're not scheduling releases. You're not, you know, doing standard software development methodologies and patterns. You're you're running or fl you know flying by the seat of your pants, supplying updates, whatever it may be. So, how can you do all those things with confidence? Um, we came up with our new solution, which is uh, Composer um, and GitLab, right? And in the process, we looked at other providers uh, for doing continuous integration builds of our code, and um, we looked at CircleCI, and Travis, and some others. They just weren't really affordable for us to use for all of our clients and establish um, you know, workflow with. So uh, we found GitLab. GitLab is a free, um, uh, repository hosting uh, environment that comes with some other functionality I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then Composer is a, uh, I'll also explain what that is, but t together the two created our new solution. Um, and let me go one, I got a, a new question. Uh, does anybody know the beef that some PHP developers have with the Composer logo? He's conducting. He is conducting, boom. Uh, would you like to steal some socks, a shirt, or go with what's in the box? Uh, what's in the box? Oh. Did I get lab notebook? Great your diary in there. All right. <laughs> All right. So what is Composer? Um, Composer, when I, I first started writing this slide, I wrote, Composer is a package manager for PHP. Wrong. Composer is a dependency manager for PHP, and what that means is it allows you to find packages within your project that are dependent either on one another or in your project as a whole. Um, it's also the standard now uh, way to build PHP projects, um, and it provides uh, an auto-loading auto um, interface. So if somebody can define what auto-loading is, you already won. <laughs> This is going to be a bad explanation, but it's like if something is needed, it will be called upon at the point of execution rather than being previously stated as needed. That's, that's, that's good enough, yeah. I, I think that's a good one. So basically, um, you don't have to uh, include all of the code until it needs to be executed. But basically what you said there. So, um, yeah. Would you like to steal or? Oh, oh, that's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> is there another box or is there? Uh, there's, there's a box. Let's okay. see. There might be some redundancy in gifts, but that's all right. So what? Uh, what are the options? Uh, I can't tell you. It's what's in the box or steal from uh, another. What's in the box? Uh, what's in the box? More socks in the box. Very <laughs> <laughs> oh, catch. Yeah, those are sweet socks, by the way. Um, so why learn Composer, right? I mean. Uh, there's so many things out there to keep up with, but if you're going to be doing PHP development, uh, especially Drupal, um, you know at some point you're you're going to need you're going to run into Composer. 
So that's really the main reason. Um, if you want to develop modern PHP applications, uh, you're going to want to learn it. If you want to use non-Drupal libraries in your Drupal project to expedite development, you're going to want to learn it. Um, so plenty of reasons for that. Um, Composer is basically, you know, if you're building a new com Composer project, it's basically just a JSON file uh, in your project root um, that is made up with some properties that define your dependencies and other properties that define the name of your project. Um, you know, there's several dozen properties that you can find, but the, the main one is um, require, and require is the, um, you know, is your dependencies in production, right? So if you need views or you need uh, a symphony uh, component, you're going to define it in your requirements there. Uh, there's also required dev. Uh, an example of something that you would do in dev is like PHP unit testing or BHAD or something like that. You can define that as dev dependency. And then when you build your project, those are only included um, in development. Uh, and then beyond that, another important one that we use is the scripts property. And scripts allow you to, it's kind of like Drupal hooks. There's before and after um, hooks that can fire whenever you're running either Composer install or Composer update. And that allows you to set up your project or, you know, um, run NPM install or, you know, trigger other processes that are related to your build. Those can be defined in the scripts property. Um, is there any questions about Composer? Like, you know, why you would use it, what? An observation is the, um, what you add after what you need, like on the require stuff, can change its behavior uh, greatly. For instance, if you put a specific version, you can lock it down to a version. Sure. You can say, keep it within 3.x, yes. so you can automatically get uploads, or you can say, just keep it the latest. Yep, exactly. And there's, uh, so there's a different syntax within the requirement. I guess I should get behind the microphone. Uh, there's different uh, syntax within the requirements based on the version, like he was saying. So you can hard code a specific version. You can say, I want at least 2.8, which I believe what the tilde is. I'm not an expert in the syntax. Jonathan is. I think he's been studying it pretty hard. Uh, but anyways, let, yeah. So you can lock those in. Another benefit is when you run Composer install, it creates a composer.lock file. And that really is what locks in your dependencies because when you run this today, you know, the version it, it may pull down is 2.9, right? And then tomorrow 2.10 comes out, but unless you explicitly tell it to go to the next version, it's going to be locked in at... Uh, yeah, that's, that's the main reason for bringing it up is yeah. my first mistake was to lock in and I would do Composer update and suddenly I realized it was well behind on a bunch of modules. Sure. I was locked in. Yep, that's it. And... Um, you know, another point is uh, a lot of times when you're uh, building your project, you can just run composer commands to have this file created for you as opposed to hard coding these values. Um, and when you run updates on something, um, you're going to be doing that in, in the command line versus coming in here and editing this file most of the time. Um, so yeah, composer, it rocks. So the next um, utility is GitLab, the, the company that gave us all this purple and orange stuff to give away. It's pretty cool. Um, it's basically just like GitHub. I think everybody's familiar with that. Um, but it has some added functionality. It has continuous integration services built in. Um, it has free private repos so that you, know, uh, you can have as many repos as you want and not have to worry about them being public or whatever. Um, uh, it also has... Uh, code review built in, a wiki built in. It's just they're, they're trying to become like you know the, the be all end all for development. I mean, you could use it as your project management tool for issues. Um, you could use it as your uh, wiki for how tos. Um, so it's it's a really cool product. Um, the free version, I will uh, warn you that I think it's like their active dev branch. Uh, that you're running on when you use their free version because they're always deploying releases that are tagged as, you know, alpha, beta, RC1, and you're like, well, I'm using this. Uh, <laughs> what's up with that? And it, it goes down sometimes, but uh, for the benefit and the value that it provides, we haven't gotten to the point where um, it's become a problem, in our business at least. And um, if it does become a problem, you can purchase on-premise. You can purchase... Um, 
their hosted uh, solution as well. So, and I, I think those would be once you start paying somebody, they probably make make it a little more stable. At least that's my thought process. Um, so why use GitLab? Again, there's uh, unlimited free repositories. That's a huge benefit for us uh, and the CI services that are built in. Um, it's easy to use. Um, it's relatively fast interface. Um, I think Bitbucket is probably like faster than GitHub. They're, they're faster, but they don't have as many features out of the box or they're more expensive. Um, uh, it's extendable, so there's a lot of um, integrations that you can in include in GitLab. Uh, one of the things that we do is tag all of our commits with a JIRA issue, and when those hit uh, the GitLab environment, it closes out or takes an action on the JIRA issue so that we don't have to worry about, you know, did we close out this issue? And then we can also go back uh, in GitLab and see the issue history related to the project. You know, if, if we've worked on a problem for a client and then another client has that problem, you know, either in JIRA or GitLab, we can kind of you know, distill down what that problem was and how we solved it in the first place. Um, so GitLab CI is, um, is the service that allows you to, whenever a commit hits Git, uh, GitLab, run a build of your project, um, run tests, run um, npm install, run compile your SAS. You, know, you can do all these workflow type things in the repository uh, when a commit happens versus in your local development and then committing all those uh, assets um, to, to your uh, code base. So uh, to just explain this a little bit, there's a couple properties. Um, GitLab is a YAML file um, and the top uh, value here is an image that will be used to build your process or to build your project. Um, and we use a Docker image uh, that's got PHP installed and a couple other things, Drush and um, a couple other utilities built in already. Um, but you can really use any Docker image you want. Uh, you can build your own or, or grab one that's already baked um, to put in there. And then once that's bootstrapped, it's going to run a before script. And these are all uh, simple bash commands. Um, and what this particular command is doing is setting up uh, SSH aliases um, or SSH authentication so that we can actually push the code once it's built into an environment. Um, and then again, there's a, a couple more um, just bash commands. That's really all this is, is different bash commands and when they should be executed. And if at any point along the line one of these fails, the entire build fails. So, you know, if um, you get down here and you run composer install to start building your project from your composer.json file and a patch doesn't apply or, um, you know, there's, there's some other issue that it can't assemble your project it's going to fail, and then nothing else below that is going to execute. So that's you know, really cool. I mean, if, if you push something up and it fails, you know immediately before it goes into your production environment that, you know, fuse is now broken or whatever it may be. Um, and then the last part in this is uh, a command that we were using to push this code into production, and we were pushing it real good. If anybody gets that, uh, if anybody knows the artist, there you go. Uh, and since yeah, you're probably going to need these pants if you're going to dance to uh, salt and pepper. Oh, you can steal, yes. I keep forgetting them. But those are pretty sweet, so I figured you yeah. You can trade. You can trade if you don't want to. You can have an auction, too. I'm afraid I will have to. Jonathan gets a pen. I can. <laughs> I got I got other sizes too, you know. <laughs> That's like small. I, I, I would, you know, I don't I don't know if everybody wants to see you wearing small. Next year we expect you to see me wearing those. Probably. And dancing with salt and pepper. It's your loss. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Yeah. So, all of these things, you know, we've got. Uh, Composer install, we're using it for everything to build our projects. We're pushing it to GitLab. Um, you know, the, the commands are, are building our project and pushing them into our hosting environments. And, and all we have to do is run Composer install and not have to worry about you know, different bash scripts or whatever's going on uh, with each project. So, so we kind of feel like this man, Randy Savage, uh, on some kind of like psychedelic trip standing up on the ropes. We're just like, we're on top of the world, right? 
because uh, we solved all our problems again. Um, and if anybody can give me their best Randy Savage. Yeah, he's got the GitLab pants on. Good point. <laughs> anybody that hasn't uh, won, I think Lee Walker could give me a good... Uh, <laughs> what? For the wrong country. Oh, oh, you don't even know who Randy Savage is. That's right. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? Randy Savage? Come on. Nothing? You already won. All right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, everybody's shy. I understand. So, you know, we solved our problems. We're on top of the world. But really... We're just like Randy Savage, all jacked up, yelling at Hulk Hogan every time something goes wrong because now we have all these bash commands all over the place in our GitLab configuration and you know, still we haven't solved the problem of standardizing everything. And when we come up with a new you know, workflow or process for a client, we have to backdate and see like, well, this client didn't have that yet, so we've got to go back. What, what did they have? What didn't they have? You know, how are we doing it then? How are we doing it now? Um, so we solved a lot of problems, but we still had you know, more, more problems to solve. Um, so this is an introduction to what we've been working on over the past couple months. Um, we're, we're still trying to come up with a name, uh, but our company's Blue Oak Interactive. Uh, so we have the B-O-I-C-I, right? It's a PHP utility built on Symfony um, components that allows you to have um, just identical GitLab configs. Um, it allows you to set up your local development environment. So if you have like your local settings.php or your local um, file, like your you know, site's default files, um, you don't want to have that like in your repository. So how do you keep things separated, have a nice workflow? So it allows you to like symlink assets outside of your project into your local development project. Um, it allows you to, um, have build steps for all your project or build steps that are specific to a particular environment. So you might want to, when you run Composer install, have it automatically run npm install, but you might be using um, like, uh, what's, what's the live reload utility? Browser sync. Browser sync or something else. Like you might have a, a development workflow for compiling SAS that refreshes a browser or something else that you wouldn't be doing in a production environment. Um, so you can define um, that in your local development uh, build process, but have you know a different way to compile SAS in your production environment. Um, it allows you to set your site up for testing um, during continuous integration. So one example would be you know you push a commit up um, while it's building your site, it goes and downloads the production database, installs that into Drupal in the continuous integration environment, runs tests on that to make sure that you know the active configuration of your project and the active configuration of your code is going to pass all your tests still. Um, and then again, you know, it's just running through those steps, and if any of those steps fail along the way, the entire build's going to fail. You're going to know you can address it and move on. Um, and then the last cool thing that it does is it creates artifact repos for pushing your code into um, different environments. So an example of that would be um, what, what hosting companies do people use? Just you use Acquia. Pantheon, Pantheon, okay, platform. So you know that each one of those, they have their own build process that they kind of want you to adopt, which may not work with you, may, may or may not. Uh, they have their own file structure that you have to match to get their code into their environment. So our utility allows you to build a project to match Pantheon or build a project to match platform without having to set that config um, you know, per project kind of thing. Uh, it just kind of streamlines some of that stuff. Um, so, does anybody know that guy on top of the uh, mountain there? It's a pinnacle. Huh? Pinnacle. Pinnacle. Pardon. Thank you. You might win the gift. I'll take some socks. More pants. <laughs> Uh, are they? There you go. So what, what I'm going to show you here is um, a little example of Dorner, your trick's not working. Come on. Come on. Command tab. 
I selected quick time. That's probably because I got this. Let's see. Oh yeah, there we go. All right. So this is uh, a pre-recorded demo because I'm not an idiot that's going to try to come up here and uh, do this live. <laughs> uh, and so what this is is a Drupal seven or eight. I can't remember. Se I think it's a Drupal seven project. Yes, Drupal seven. Um, in which I am adding meta tag module to my project. We built um, the Drupal project to use Composer um, because you can do that now for Drupal 7. They have their own packages um, available that's like packages, packagist. Um, and so all I'm saying is Composer required Drupal meta tag. Uh, what's going on here? It's resolving the dependencies. It's going out and building the project uh, with Composer.json, updating the lock file. Um, it's adding our BOICI command to symlink all of our assets, such as like local settings.php, into the project. Um, it is, um, oh, so I'm jumping ahead here, but uh, it created or updated the composer.json composer.lock file. I then committed those changes. I pushed those up to GitLab. And this is an example of one commit triggering three builds that are pushing to Pantheon, Aqua, and Platform all at the same time. Um, and the cool thing about that is, like I said, e each project or each hosting environment has their own config, but with this, it doesn't matter. We can just you know, push it up and not have to worry about it. We know that when it gets built and pushed to these environments, it's gonna match the desired um, output. Um, and so this is kind of the same process <laughs> that you already saw with Composer install running. Um, we could have tests running here. We could have other things being compiled. Um, let me see, it gets a little long, so I'll go ahead and skip to the most important part where it says. Doo -doo -doo. Just to prove I'm not crazy. Boom! And uh, yeah, all the builds failed. I skipped that part, but when you see the green light in GitLab, that's the best part, right? If it goes red, then you, you cry a little. Um, but here, look, let a tag. Mm. Meta tag, somewhere in that one. Boom. And finally, meta tag. So, I think that's pretty cool. Um, so that's the demo. We went through that. Um, I put some resources on my slide that will get posted um, to the camp website. Um, our continuous integration utility, um, some examples, so this repo, um, I don't know if I'll, actually, after we get through questions, I'll, I can go through some of this stuff, but um, basically the, the CI utility that you can include in your Composer project, um, it allows you to uh, run the commands that I showed as far as um, setting up your local development, pushing it to um, your hosting environments. It also allows you, one thing I probably skipped over, um, it allows you, if you have a, a Drush make site for either Drupal 6 or Drupal 7, you can have Composer just execute the scripts to build that project. So you're still running Composer install, and then it's triggering Drush make to assemble your project, um, which is pretty cool because um, we have, like I said, a couple of Drupal 6 projects that are still around that we maintain, and we can still use our same workflow with those and not have to worry about um, whatever Drupal 6 weirdness is going on. So. Um, and, and you can even adopt this to WordPress. Um, our goal is with the CI utility uh, to make it it's specific to PHP because it depends on Symfony. And, but you know, ideally I'd like people with experience in Laravel, WordPress, you know, other projects to contribute to this so that the build process for those um, projects to be included. And then you know, you're, you're pushing to WP Engine or whatever it may be. So it's a open source project, we'd love uh, contributions or documentation, questions, any kind of that stuff, you know. We'd like it. Um, so does anybody have any questions about all of this? Of the other three providers, I guess, uh, Pantheon Platform and Docker, are there others that you might be on the horizon? I don't know. Um, there, there are some others. That I, I mentioned those because they're the most popular in the Drupal realm. Um, but I think it, at some point they're all based on Git. I mean, I, I know those three are, and then I haven't dealt with like a mega CC or any of the others, but if they're not based, based, on, based on Git, and you want to still utilize this workflow, 
um, which we actually have our own hosting environment that we use for some smaller projects. It's just, um, we SSH into the server, we initialize a repository, and then there's a configuration option that you can set on the repository that whenever any commits hit it, it automatically checks it out. So in that sense, we go through the same process, we push to that remote, which is just the file system of the hosting environment, and then bam, it checks out the project immediately. Um, are, are you doing the automated testing with this framework? I'm sure that's what you would add on. You can, yeah. You, um, in the CI process, after you run your builds, um, you can trigger, um, there's actually an example uh, in one of the links that shows you how to run PHP unit, um, bhat, and a couple other things, that, you know, really anything you want along the way during your build. Or you can set it up so that it's pushing the Jenkins server and just have your Jenkins scripts do what you want. Yeah, yeah, you could. I mean, this is kind of a replacement for Jenkins in a way, um, it, it, unless you, you know, if you already have Jenkins or you have like a more complicated workflow um, or Jenkins is on a VPN that has access to do things that maybe GitLab wouldn't, yeah, um, yeah, you could do that. But this was our, I mean, in the process of trying to figure out what we were going to use as a company, we looked at Jenkins, we looked at Circle CI, we looked at all these things, and uh, you know, the free factor was a little bit of a uh, you know deciding the place where the, the head of engineering liked the nice little charts you could get out of Jenkins. Oh yeah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, you, so you're not going to get you know everything out of that, but I, I think that GitLab even has some Jenkins integration, so you could skip the the CI process, push to GitLab, and have it triggered your Jenkins workflow as well. So, yes, sir. So, were you saying that GitLab is the replacement for Jenkins? Yeah, G GitLab CI. Okay. Um, it you know does the builds, the testing, everything you need in it, and you can set it up so that there's different stages. Um, so you can actually have it go ahead and push, like when you hit a, the development branch, right? You want that to go ahead and push to Pantheon's development environment. Um, you can have it go ahead and do that or hit staging and production at the same time or you know, whatever workflow you want, you can have multiple jobs running, multiple stages of those jobs. Um, yeah. Can you have conditional, I mean, sort of warning fails? Like, I know with Jenkins, we could set it up to where, oh, this test failed, but it failed with this, you know, with this string coming out of it. We'll let it go ahead and push, push out to the QA site because it's okay. not a critical error, but sure. we'll find it. Yeah, so most of this is, um, to my knowledge, and I'm sure you can, uh, you know, adapt it, but it's standard, standard error. So if at any process, uh, or at any point in the process, a standard error is thrown, the whole build fails. And that's what we do with our CI module. So if we're um, if we're running a build and then we're assembling the artifact repo to push to a hosting environment and something happens, we throw a PHP exception. And based on the Symfony CLI library that we're using, that will in turn throw an, to standard error, which will be caught here and, and fail the build. So it's right, you know, a little bash script that checks for the return error. And yeah, you could. Yeah, exactly. Wrap, wrap the test in your own. Yep. And we do some of that in our um, CI utility, um, like when the, the symlink process. So um, you define those at the project level. So what we like to do is put our settings.php and our site's default files in a subdirectory called local. So it's local settings.php, local um, files, right? And when we run our build, those are placed into site's default. Um, and so you don't want that to happen on production or a build. Um, for any other environment, really, other than local. So when it gets to that point, it just skips. It, you know, it sees that the local directory doesn't exist, and even though you've defined that in your configuration, um, it skips it and moves on. Um, and then one thing that we've been debating is, right now, if you run a build and nothing's changed, should it be an error, or should the build say, should the build skip, right? Like, I mean, if there's nothing changed and it's, it's, an, it's a deployment, is that an error, or is that just we should just ignore it because we like green lights in our builds? You know, so that's that's something that's we're debating internally and that kind of stuff. So. How do you structure your project uh, repos? Very good question. Um, so there's on the the CI. They told me not to mirror, but I can't help that. Just want to screw up the recording. It will. Yeah. Okay, I won't do it. Somebody might want to see this later. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, 
Oh, here we go, live demo. I said I wasn't going to be an idiot, but. <laughs> While I'm doing this, there's a documentation that Dustin wrote yesterday that's fantastic on the uh, CI utility um, that shows um, the sample file structure that we use. Typically, it's um, the local directory that I talked about. Um, and then there is a, a BOICI YAML file that, that's where you set up like how your symlinks should happen, uh, what the environment um, to, for production or development, like where those commits should go. Um, it's probably about like a 20 line file of configuration on how to build. And then from there, your composer.json um, scripts are pretty much the same. Your GitLab CI is pretty much identical. This is Kind of based because it is right. So we're using Simlinks. Yeah, Simlinks, sim especially even if you're doing a VM under Windows. Exactly. Or a pain. NTFS. <laughs> Hell. Yeah. Um, I, I would like some. I haven't used Windows in a while. Um, I would like some people with Windows experience to uh, contribute. But yes, that, um, it does use Simlink. But that, but that's only one component. Um, of the, the build process. It does use rsync too, so I guess I need what, like RoboCopy for Windows <laughs> or something like that. Um, so yes, unfortunately, that is a, uh, a downfall. Who could Windows subsystem for Linux? Huh? Linux subsystem for Windows work on that? Oh, right. Yeah, doesn't... Flash on Windows as they call it. Yeah, doesn't Windows have like shell built in now, like a Linux shell or something? Yeah, I mean, I would play with it and went, oh, look at that. Um, yeah. That would help. Would yeah, that might work. Sure. Um, it's supposed to have all, all of the utilities. Even, like, even, yeah. yeah. Or SIGWIN, just down on SIGWIN. Well, that, but you still have the underlying NTFS process or whatever it is these days. Yeah, right? I mean, that's, that's the best thing. I think even if you're using like the Vagrant to have a virtual box, as long as it's sharing the way you do that, you know, you want to share it because <laughs> you want to edit your, you know, the editor. Sure. Local editor. Oh, right. Well, and, and I guess maybe at that point you could have like a, um, a VDK or whatever they're called, like whatever your virtual um, environment is, yeah. the the file you know, it's a sub file system that it creates to point to that as the file system of the operating system. That's another talk, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I would like to just see how far it would get on Windows without having to uh, make too many changes. Uh, if anybody's willing to help with that, we're willing to. Um, preference by that box would be Linux, but unfortunately the company doesn't want that. Is that right? Yeah. Alright. Um, more free stuff. More free stuff. Um, yes, I actually have got something pretty cool. I gotta think of a good question now. So we can look at, um, let's see, if the documentation updated, so. It's not complete, but it's. It's not complete, but yeah, so here's a, a good example um, of what you were asking, what our, what our file system or our um, file structure looks like. Um, so libraries, this will be custom libraries for Drupal if there were any. Um, a lot of times clients will have li uh, like JavaScript libraries that they've purchased that you can't put into your build process because it requires a key or whatever. So we'll just consider that a custom module or a custom library. We'll put it in this libraries directory. Um, custom modules, any patches that aren't readily available online. Usually when we add a patch, um, so, so our, actually this is a pretty, pretty good um, point. But when we find a, a bug in Drupal core, or not core usually, but um, Drupal contrib, we'll file an issue or look for an issue that already exists. We'll fix the issue for our client and we'll create a patch of that fix and post it to the issue. It's a pretty standard Drupal you know, process and I encourage everybody to do that, whether it be just documentation or actually creating a patch to fix the problem. You should be doing that if you're using Drupal. Um, so when that happens, the, the patch is online and we'll just use the URL to the patch from drupal.org in our either um, project.make or composer.json file to patch whatever that module is, right? Um, if that's not an option for whatever reason or this is really specific to a particular client, you can put those patches in just a patches folder within the repo, commit those to the repo, and then in your build you reference those by the uh, relative. Composer or C Wiggins patch manager added? Exactly. Okay. Yep, that's what we've used. I don't know if there might be a different one or whatever, but that's what we've used as well. Um, custom themes. 
uh, boici.yaml, I'll show you an example of that. That's our utilities configuration. Um, it allows you to set up where your site's building into. Like, if you're working on an Acquia project, you're probably building into a dot root subdirectory, or if you're you know, working on platform, it's app, or whatever. So you can define that in the, the YAML file. Um, then we have our git ignore, our GitLab CI, Composer JSON and Lock, which both should be con committed uh, to the repo, in my opinion. Uh, and then we also have an aliases file, uh, Drush aliases. And so we put the aliases file there, and we also define that as a symlink in our CI file so that whenever we run Composer install, it takes the alias that's in the repo and puts it in our .drush folder so that we all have the same alias. We don't have to worry about, you know, you don't have the Drush alias for this. And another utility we use is um, Drupdates, which is pretty cool. It's Thinkbean is the company that makes it. But it allows you to have a configuration file with all your aliases listed in it, and then you run drup, drup dates, and it shows what sites across all of them need, have updates or need security updates, and it formats it in uh, like colored output in your terminal. Pretty cool. So um, that's another benefit of having the alias in the repos that we all have the same alias names. Um, and then we have, if it is a Drupal, an older Drupal 7 site or a Drupal 6 site, we'll have a project make file. And then if there is a settings.php that needs to be in production um, or one of your environments, you, we typically put it in the root. Uh, we could have like a, a production folder or whatever. But, but the good thing about the CI utility is you can put these wherever you want and you can establish or adopt the CI utility to what you're already doing based on your file structure. Um, it provided you're using Windows or uh, Linux. <laughs> um, so, let's see. And you probably don't want to push it to production because in your CI, basically, ultimately, you're going to have to have an unsigned um, SSL cert for it to automatically push out. Very good, very good um, point. So, GitLab, um, they have private variables, okay, and it's in the configuration of. Um, the repo, but it's a, a cloud service. Like so, a lot of times you're putting your private key in GitLab. It's a you know public service and or cloud service. And then if anybody were to find your private key, that's a bad thing, right? I mean, they could get into your site and, or your server, depending on what access that SSH key um, awards wreak havoc. So um, one solution that we've been looking at, I'd hope to have this ready for the presentation ran out of time. There's a company called Locker. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but uh, there's Chris Tietzel. He's based out of, um, around Seattle. Um, but his company, uh, along with Townsend Security, has developed a key management um, solution for Drupal and WordPress, uh, where anything that's uh, private passwords, API keys, anything like that, it's stored in a, a vault of sorts. And then they give you a signed certificate to make API requests against their vault to get that value, right? So what I wanted to do was instead of using, um, instead of putting our private key or whatever it may be in GitLab, put the locker certificate in there, and then in the build process say, hey, go get the public key or private key securely from locker, bring it back in, use it for the build, and then destroy it. Which, I mean, if somebody got your certificate, there, you know, there's still some some issues there. Maybe if somebody. If, Lock that certificate down. Yeah, exactly. So, yep. Yeah, yeah, they can lock it to IPs, I'm sure. And then also, if uh, if there were an issue, you just cancel the the um, the certificate. You void the certificate, and then those API calls are no longer valid. Uh, so that definitely provides a level of security. Um, the other thing would be you can put GitLab on premise. Um, and I think uh, in the last session there was a question about some you know, government requirements to have on premise. Um, utilities and so that that's an option and I think if you if it's on your own server you know and you're storing the the, the private key in that I, I don't think that's yeah, a concern it depends on your organization is whether you who gets access to those private variables and how you can you know right control them sure yeah even if it's on-prem somebody could well exactly I, I know about this basically because we had DevOps quit and he took the keys with him, so I had to reverse engineer how he was doing it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Break into the site. Oh, man. Okay. Well, then it was good that he had so it. Was it was good that it was there. Yeah. yeah. It was going to get a little bit insecure, so you can figure it out if you really need to. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good point. 
Um, all right, we're pretty much out of time. I'll, I'll run through this. Um, this is the CI YAML <coughs> file um, that tells you, it tells your project how to be built. Um, our build root is www, so that means whenever you run Composer install, it's going to put everything in a www subdirectory of your project that's excluded in your gitignore because you don't want to commit that, right? You're building it and you're adopting this methodology to build your project using continuous integration. Don't commit your build. Um, the temp directory is just any directory where the CI utility can dump files while it's running its build and tasks temporarily um, that gets cleared out when it's done. Uh, these are the sim links. So the, the first example is um, if your site has a custom robots.txt file for whatever reason, the one that comes packaged with Drupal when you run a build, it's in Drupal's repo, so it's going to come into your project from that build. Uh, this allows you to override one, uh, override the, uh, the robots.txt with one that's in your project root or wherever you want to put it in your, in your repo. Can you use the robots.txt module? Yeah, you could do that, but another module another module, another module, <laughs> I mean, or one line of, yeah. Um, and again, this is just how we solve these problems. Um, we've kind of, adopt, we've built this utility based on our experiences, based on things that we've had to do. There's a hundred different ways to do anything, uh, so we're, we're open to other suggestions. Um, but an example of a Drupal 6 or Drupal 7 site where you have a custom themes folder, or a custom modules folder, we typically put that in the root of our project. I don't know. This is probably not very legible from way back there, but it is on the, the, the site that you can link to. Um, but you find your, your local assets, they get symlinked into the project. In this example, they get symlinked to uh, site's default themes, site's default modules, site's default libraries. Um, here's the example of the settings.php. I mentioned getting that into your build. Um, and then the alias that I mentioned, having a common alias committed in your repo and how that gets symlinked uh, into your um, dot drush folder so that it's available with all of your other aliases. And finally, the most important part, this is where, and this is a little verbose, um, it doesn't have to be this complicated, you really only need two lines here, uh, but this is where you define your environment. So in this uh, case, we've got a development environment uh, with a git URL of example.com and the branch is development. So when our build runs and we create our artifact repo, it gets pushed to that uh, branch. So uh, Pantheon, for example, when the artifact repo gets built, it gets pushed to Pantheon, and then it's in the format that Pantheon likes, and you just load the dev site there. Um, platform has their own like build process where it destroys all the containers your site's running on. It reassembles. It's, it's also, it's kind of like the same build workflow of your site, except it's building the containers that are running your site from, from scratch every single time. Um, and that's pretty much it. I'm happy to talk with people about this afterwards. If anybody's interested in testing it out or contributing to it, we would love that. Um, Any developer utilities like, you know, okay, I want to sync with production. I'm ready to start out a new feature and I want to resync my local with production. Absolutely. There is um, a command, and we haven't documented all the commands yet. Uh, let's see if I can yeah, just... That's one of the last two pieces that I've got. Okay. So these are all the commands that we currently have available, and you probably can't see it from there, but I'll just go through them really quick. Build Drush Make, this allows you to build a site from a Drush Make file using Composer, which is kind of weird, but again, we're trying to streamline everything and make it common across all projects. Build Sim Links, we'll set up the Sim Links that we talked about. Build Tasks allows you to um, run either environment-specific tasks or project-wide tasks that I talked about, like compiling, CS, or compiling your CSS. Uh, deploy git is the way that, uh, that's the command that gets run to create the artifact repo and push it to your environment to find in your config. And then we have uh, some Drush wrappers where um, you said s like synchronize the site. So there's dr uh, Drush sync DB, which is um, the same thing as like SQL dump and SQL, you know, it, uh, but it, it provides a scope around your build and your environment so that you can easily sync from one to the other. <laughs> Developers That's true. Yeah, but, but the benefit and why we wrote this is because when a project is building, if you want to run tests, this will allow you to sync the database from production into continuous integration environment, run your tests, and then know that you're dealing with the most recent data. Um, and then a, a couple more Drush wrappers, and then there's a GitLab init um, method that we use, and that just kind of sets up some extra stuff for the configure for the continuous integration environment like the SSH keys that we talked about. Um, 
And, and the benefit of this is our GitLab CI files were like this long, and now they're like this long. And it's and we know that every client is running you know the same process now. Um, we had like one client was an Aquia client, and he had dev stage prod, and there was like a dozen bash commands to build the site and push it to Aqua in each environment, and now we just have, you know, basically one command to do that, so. I think that's it. Um, any more questions? No? All right, good deal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.